Hi. Um, I just wondered what the panel's thoughts were about what are um, what you bring as a designer when you bring in a certain set of ethical. Um, how can I put this? Um, you come from uh, a particular cultural background and particular uh, cultural and uh, ethical environment and how do you act in an environment that is perhaps not of your background and not of your ethical belief and how do you not bring that into the picture? How do you in a way uh, isolate your own um, sort of feelings about a situation that you have to design in because that is that, that's kind of tricky. I don't, can I, ah, there we go. Um, <coughs> pardon me, let me cough into my mic first and deafen you all. Um, I think there's two things. I, I, then you guys jump in, obviously. Um, I think there's two things. One is don't work alone. So that's why you have a team. Uh, you keep each other honest. Um, but more importantly, observe. So it's something that I realized during your talk that I forgot to say is that, uh, you know, it's not enough to ask people what they think, it's you, you must observe them. And I don't just mean observing them using a service that already exists, I mean observing them in their natural habitat, observing how they behave naturally and trying to understand yeah, what their culture is and what their ethics are and what their natural behaviors are rather than trying to get them to conform to yours. So I think it's a two-sided thing. One side is about observation um, and, and really taking that in and accepting that there is a difference to the way that you function. Um, and the other is to not work alone, because the, if you share that burden of responsibility with a team of people, especially with a cross-disciplinary team of people, so design, tech, business, etc., um, it makes it easier to keep each other honest and to keep each other above board. I would interpret, do we need it? I would interpret that question yeah. a bit different. Yeah, the recording. Uh, yeah, I think I would interpret that question a bit different. Uh, from my experience, the design students uh, like to work social. Uh, they like to um, do projects that have a high ethical standard that are either of social or environmental value. And I think that's great. They often come with a rather idealistic attitude. And I do serve that attitude and I share it. Uh, and I do quite a bit of social or public service design projects. But I think they necessarily have to confront themselves with the economic reality out there. And that economic reality is often not in first priority driven by social or uh, ecological values. It's often driven by economical values. And uh, I think part of uh, studying service design is to understand the system of economy and how you can relate to it as a designer without, well, without giving your values away. But I think if you want to earn money as a designer and set up a service design agency, you have to work for banks and insurance companies, for electronic industries and for, uh, well, for big players that might in many aspects are not the ideal companies. Uh, so I try to confront and I try to enable students to, to learn uh, this. And I encourage them to kind of, you know, be reflective about their own values. And there are most certainly uh, borders where, where some people will say, no, I'd rather not do that project than go into it. But you cannot, most people cannot do social service design all their life. One quick answer, somehow in between. I think it's about change of perspective and, and having empathy, no matter what you do, and having empathy for the big company that is trying to change as much as the consumer outside. It's about translating those views and, and uh, yeah, having, having empathy, basically. Translation is a really good word. Um, I see a similar thing, and I um, teach in a, also in a design strategy <laughs> MBA program in San Francisco, where basically every single student wants to change the world uh, in a dramatic way, but I also have to make a living because it's one of the ten most expensive cities in the world. Um, Yet, I'm crazy enough to always to encourage them, well, since you understand system, redesign a system, right? And um, again, the, the most important part in these systems is, is the humans, right? There's this um, the little, little story, um, Robert Fabricant 
chief uh, creative uh, a guy from, from Frog once said, I mean, it's pretty tough to change the energy grid, but it's, it, it's also tough to change humans, but it's probably easier to change like humans' use of the energy grid, and then the energy grid will follow than the other way around. So again, it's about changing humans, and when you're working, for example, with, with senior leadership in traditional organizations, you can, if you change a little bit in their perspective, they might be the ones that then bring on like future leadership to take over the stewardship of, of, of those companies. And I, um, I often refer, refer to it that I see actually in the economy you have, there are important layers of, of, of humans inside these systems, which is people that found companies, people that work in those companies, the workforce, people that run those companies, management, and they are all the younger generation, they all have a completely changed value set. So they are creating these new companies. They're <coughs> creating, actually, kind of twisting the existing status quo. And so they, they are redesigning these systems. And I think they're also kind of challenging what are actually economic units are and how um, um, value is expressed through, through these economic units. Um, more questions? Uh, yeah. Hi, really appreciate the, the focus on people and aligning services and products and organizations with their, with their needs. I guess my question would be, um, what happens in those situations when people's sort of hopes and dreams and satisfaction aren't aligned with the company? I'm thinking, exa for example, a couple years ago, Walmart took, the, you know, they took a lot of product off the shelf. They made things more pleasant in the stores. Customer satisfaction went way up. Uh, but then they lost, uh, I think, almost $2 billion uh, in sales because it, it turned out that having more satisfied customers actually wasn't better for their business. So how, how do you square that? I, d I don't know. Well, I don't know either. <laughs> so, I do. <laughs> I, do. Well, I, I, guess you, I guess you would try to avoid it when you design the new service by co-creating with customers, by doing prototyping, by doing testing. And I certainly think in the design process you would try everything to avoid such kind of a late learning. Um, but uh, I would not know the solution what Walmart should have done to, to not lose their customers. Maybe it's in the process. I think, uh, well, I think it's, it is the process, but it's also the right at the beginning. So that... That stuff I was saying about understanding what, what the problem is that you're trying to solve. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And, and so the, the problem they were trying to solve, obviously, was make the store a more pleasant experience for people. But that was not the right problem for them to solve. Right? So that's something that, something that you know, I, in my agency days, and still as a consultant, um, have to cope with with clients all the time. Is, all right, what is the problem you're trying to solve? They tell me. OK, why do you think that's the right problem for you? What are you trying to accomplish with it? And that's the thing. There's a, it sounds to me like there were two la layers of misalignment. The first one was that the problem that they solved was not the right problem to achieve their business goal. And that was because they didn't understand the why behind the what that is the behavior of their customers. Yeah? <laughs> that was a very good question, Felix. Nice. I like it. Um, more questions? More questions. Come on, guys. Okay. Who, has, who of you has been at the Little Service Design sub-conference last year? Ah, okay, a few. So you already know that I'm a very fierce a moderator, right? <laughs> I, well, I would just go into the audience and seek people out, and then suddenly they have questions because they are afraid of me. But <laughs> it still didn't work after my talk last year. That's true. <laughs> but we, we had another friend of ours in the audience who always asked a question. Remember that? Mm -hmm. right. So um, look, they're running away already, Alex. <laughs> Don't run away. You have to at least ask one question. <laughs> He's a smart man. Fair play. Okay, then I I'll, have I'll, a. I'll, sorry, I've got a question. Okay, um, otherwise I have one. Oh, okay. Yeah, how, how would you um, how would you suggest that um, those of us who don't come from the design background in, in, in large corporates we create the space 
for this kind of experimentation because I think there, there are a lot of common themes about the method of doing this and I think at one level uh, top management in large corporates understand that some of this little magic needs to be spread in their organization but they don't necessarily they're not actually consistent in unlocking budgets FTEs space mind space their own attention etc so how, how what are the methods by which you can you can unlock those and, and I, I don't really want to hear just about the logical arguments because I know the logical arguments are very strong it's really about the methods that, you, that you've experienced in, in clients or whoever who've unlocked stakeholders one of my most favorite questions actually because having <coughs> ideas is one thing and we have them all and we have the post-its but getting them actually done and through the organization that's the hard thing um, I think there's something about being really specific intentional and clear about the goals so you said it earlier, a goal to increase sales is a completely different goal than trying to innovate and come up with new solutions and reinvent companies. And it's really hard to do this from within companies because the goals of the day-to-day -day business are very differently the methods and the management, the operational excellence, um, than when you're trying to disrupt who you are as a company. So one thing that um, I've seen working with big corporations, you have higher chances of success when you make sure that the people who work on these ideas are shielded away from the day-to-day -day as far as possible to not be a victim of the antibodies of the companies. Meaning, you know, um, it's about, no, it's actually not a 20% job, it's a 100 or 200% job. You need a different space um, that allows you to fail uh, to hang out, to, to create some waste, you know, to, to gather different type of data, to, to be inspired. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking and working and getting actually things done. Uh, I talked a little bit about decision-making processes that are very different in innovation than in the day-to-day -day business. Um, so to your question, if, if uh, you know, the innovators around you uh, fight for your space, uh, literally the physical and the, the mental space, um, and, and seek different rules of engagement uh, with, with your managers and, and show the results um, continuously so that you get uh, more trust uh, and, and more permission, basically. Yeah, that's, that's, the other, that's the only thing I, I would just amplify the last bit of that about showing results on an ongoing basis. So it's, I think especially in big organizations who are resistant to change, it's, it's hard enough to get the ball rolling and then, you, uh, then people get nervous and as soon as they need to cut costs, as soon as there's any kind of pressure, that's the first thing they're going to cut because it's the thing that they're least comfortable with. So there has to be a constant feedback loop and, it, and that means that the rigor by which you ensure that the thing you are doing is perfectly aligned to the goals of the business has to be really, really strong. That way you can demonstrate progress. One last comment. Uh, we had this one quote uh, in, in a project called Good Things Grow in the Shade. That's the shade. Innovation needs the shade of a little seedling hiding and, and really growing until it can be shown. And the biggest risk for innovation is, is too much love, too much attention. Everyone says, that's my baby, and, and the other one put too much money, so you, you're kind of not going after the results, there is no urgency, um, or there's too much time, and, and you don't put yourself under pressure. So watch out for these three. I have, I have two quick thing, uh, things to add, some practical things. One thing is, so in basi basically in all these different theories around innovation, there's the concept of the edge. So like to basically work, work at the fringe of a company in areas that are basically not endangering the core of the DNA of the company. So you know that they won't really challenge um, what the, com the company's belief system, but you can try out processes there, and if they prove successful, they will move the, you move them closer to the core. That's one thing, and when you do this, don't call it design. That's the other, other thing. <laughs> so you can do whatever you want, and you, you hear, use your empathy, use your emp empathic research skills to find out the, the terminology that the leadership that has to like sign off on the budget loves. And if, if they want to call it... Call it um, uh, uh, Badger safari. But budget <laughs> jump camp, then you call it that. <laughs> and um, if they want to call it um, product design um, 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 fun sprint, you call it that. And if somebody comes to you and says, I want to do a design thinking process, and, but you look at what they want to do, they want, what, what they want to do, something can be different, you will call it design thinking. That's what you do. So that's, that, that's from my experience.
the mm. way you roll. Don't stick to terminology because that's what we all designers love. Because, because our the terminologies we use are changing all the time. And, and don't, don't stick to terminologies. Really look what, after what the terminology means and how to create a value and substantiate it. Yeah? I would contradict a little bit. I, I would basically say, yes, we have to learn to understand the language of our clients, and we are not the design knows all uh, uh, people, uh, but we also make a difference by wording. And sometimes uh, interventions that are rooted in language can be very fruitful. So if you convince a company to use a different name for a specific, specific role in the company, that can create irritation, and irritation can be the start of something new. So I would not be just quite as careless. I would uh, see how far can we go and where can we stretch the mind of our clients and, and intervene by, by language. And we know how important language is as a cultural setting and as a mindset. So yeah, maybe we can discuss that later. Oh yeah. <laughs> is, that's, that's the other thing, like our whole discipline or an array of disciplines, probably, uh, in, in that matter, needs way more discourse because I think we all agree on like that what we are all doing is, is not very well substantiated in, in an academic sense. And as I mean, there is, yes, 20 years of service science and, and so on, and, and, but still, we have a long way to go. And that, but that is really exciting because it's something else we can design, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think one last question. Come on, one last question. See, this is what I do to people. And then it's like, yes, okay. Torture. Um, one last question. I, I really... You have... Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Um, just one other point, and probably for the, the German uh, people on the panel, I guess, uh, primarily. But um, so in some organizations that I've experienced, uh, let's not mention the one I work for now, um, there's a certain mentality that innovation comes from California and execution and concreteness comes from Germany. Um, <laughs> how, would you, uh, how would you respond to that? Or rather should, or rather should come from I have an answer to it, but it's, I go there. It actually means innovation shouldn't come from Germany. I think that's, the, that's kind of the point sometimes. <laughs> I mean, having lived in California, I, I know what you're talking about. There's, there's a different. I think it's, it's in the middle. It's, it's both. You need, as I talked about, you know, you need to see the possibility and believe in it. The, yes, we can do it attitude, um, but and the lightness. But then you actually need to, to get it done to make it real. So I think um, you need both. You need the Californian mindset and and the German drive for execution. But I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not so sure if. if um, we need to, speaking about terminology, stick to it. <laughs> and we do know a couple of cases where quite the opposite is true, where the invention was made in Germany and the innovation was made in uh, California, because in Germany the invention did not find any fruitful soil to grow on. So I guess we have to be a bit more differentiated about this. I guess the only thing I would add to that is that, uh, I mean, and you, you probably know this as well as I, perception is reality. So whatever that perception is, and I guess this is more to Alexander's point, is whatever the perception is in your organization, to some degree you have to play to that, right? You can try to change it, but the best way to change it is by offering evidence um, to say, you know, you start with, okay, fair play, and I don't know, tell people, tell people your consultant's from California, and, and then away you go. But, uh, but then once you've got some results to show, you can start to work away at that mentality. Maybe I can add one encouragement for, for the companies. Uh, uh, an older research uh, that I used quite a bit uh, said that in Germany it is 3,270 euro per year in average per employee invested in research and development in the producing industries. And in the service industries it's only I think something like 67 euro per year per employee in average invested in research and development. So it seems there is quite a gap and it could make sense to uh, invest in systematical thinking out of the box and, and inventing and uh, playing around in order to create these seeds that then can, can grow towards innovation. Uh, and I do see a gap of uh, investment, I see a gap of roles that are uh, implemented into the structures of companies. We could use a lot more service innovators and service designers in the management board. So yeah, there is room for improvement, I guess.
and um, the states are definitely, uh, and, and the, the West Coast, are one of the areas where that's already happening. So where the, these people are actually elevated to um, even to sea level uh, leadership positions. But one last point before we end this is because that the goes. We love to talk a lot, right? This is like, but the, the thing about like you know one of the next to the whole like service orientation, one of the main competitive advantages that has been like shown in a lot of research studies is diversity. And I guess to your point, like uh, Europe, United States, Germany, the United States, and so on, UK, Scandinavia, if you have very diverse teams that complement each other with very collaborative uh, uh, mindsets and cultures, it's very hard to go wrong with that. So that's what I would say, because again, it's human. That's, that's, that's basically channel, uh, channeling the human power inside those systems. All right? Okay, thank you very much. That was a nice closing question. Um, let me say thank you all. Uh, Birgit, Luisa, Anne, and Alexander, I much appreciated that you were here today. Thank you and say chapeau.